Today, my friends, is the eighth day or the octave day of Easter, a day that is known in the church as the Feast of Divine Mercy. You know, in Jewish tradition, the great pilgrimage feasts like Passover did not last just a single day. In Jewish tradition, our ancestors in the faith went up to Jerusalem to celebrate the great pilgrimage feast, but they stayed in the holy city to worship and to give thanks to God through prayer and sacrifice for a period of eight days from one Sabbath until the next. And it was on the eighth day, on the final day of the feast, that God would pour out his blessings in a superabundant way. And in the same way, today on the eighth day of Easter, the Lord has promised to pour out extraordinary graces and blessings upon us, upon all of those who approach him this day with a humble heart, with a clean heart, with an attitude of repentance and trust in him. In the diary of St. Faustina, who is the apostle of divine mercy, our Lord Jesus says, on this day, the very depths of my tender mercy are open, and I will pour out a whole ocean of graces on those who approach the font of my mercy. The soul that will go to confession and receive Holy Communion shall obtain complete forgiveness of sins and the punishment due to sin. On this day, the divine floodgates through which graces flow are opened, and so let no soul fear to draw near to me, even though its sins be as scarlet. For mankind will not find peace until he turns to the font of my mercy. Let's unpack that a little. There are two things I want to point out about that statement, which has been approved by the church as being worthy of our belief. First of all, our Lord Jesus says that he offers us a unique and extraordinary grace on this day, namely the forgiveness of sins, but also the temporal punishment due to sin. Some have called this a kind of second baptismal grace. In other words, our souls will be cleansed, and even the temporal punishment due to sin will be remitted or canceled, so that from this day forward, we start out anew on our journey to God, just like an infant who has just been baptized. Think of what an extraordinary gift of mercy this is. But our Lord also says that we must go to confession to receive this grace. And the church has interpreted this to mean that we must have confessed our sins in the days or the weeks leading up to the feast, and that we receive him this day worthily in Holy Communion, namely in the state of grace. In the gospel today, on this second Sunday of Easter, we see how this overflowing ocean of God's mercy was poured out upon his apostles and upon one of the apostles in particular. In the gospel today, St. John tells us that on Easter Sunday, the risen Lord appeared to the apostles and he breathed upon them. And he empowered them through the gift of the Holy Spirit to forgive sins in his name. Just three days before, on the night before he died, our Lord ordained his apostles as priests. And he empowered them to make him truly present, body and blood, soul and divinity, under the humble sacramental signs of bread and wine. And then on Easter Sunday night, as his very first gift to the church after rising from the dead, our Lord instituted the sacrament of reconciliation as the ordinary sacramental means for the forgiveness of our sins, and in particular, for the forgiveness of mortal sin or serious sin. Jesus said, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. And then he breathed upon the apostles, giving them the gift of the Holy Spirit, and said, whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. And yet, as we just heard, one of the apostles, Thomas, was not with the others 
on Easter Sunday in the upper room when the, when the Lord appeared to them there. Later on, after Thomas had returned, the others told him what happened, how the risen Christ had appeared to them. But Thomas stubbornly refused to believe until he could see the Lord with his own eyes and touch him, his wounds, with his own hand. Despite his lack of faith, our Lord showed great mercy and love to Thomas when he appeared to him eight days later on the second Sunday of Easter. And he invited him then to see and to touch the wounds in his hands and his side, to be no longer unbelieving, but to surrender and to believe. Our Lord also said to Thomas, speaking about future generations of Christians like ourselves, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And it was at that point that Thomas made that beautiful profession of faith, which we ourselves make, my Lord and my God. Today on this Feast of Divine Mercy, I want to say something about each of the five most important aspects or parts of the message of divine mercy. I've already spoken about the first part, namely the feast of divine mercy itself, by designating or naming that unique grace that our Lord gives us in this feast, the forgiveness of our sin and the temporal punishment due to sin. The second aspect of our Lord's message to St. Faustina, whose relic we have in our altar, is the hour of divine mercy. This is the hour when our Lord Jesus breathed out his last breath on the cross. St. John tells us that in that hour, the three o'clock hour, at the moment of our Lord's death, one of the Roman soldiers who was standing guard at the foot of the cross to make sure that Jesus was dead before his body was taken down, pierced his side, his very heart, with a lance. And immediately, St. John says, blood and water poured out. This is the source of the unending fountain of mercy that our Lord speaks about, the waters of baptism, by which we were cleansed of original sin and adopted as children of God, the blood of of the Holy Eucharist, the sacrifice through which we receive the gift of eternal life. The third and fourth aspects of the message of divine mercy have to do with prayer. On the 13th of September in the year 1935, while at prayer, St. Faustina had a vision of an angel. It was the angel of God's wrath who was sent from heaven to chastise and to punish the earth. And Faustina was struck with great fear as she saw this. She began to plead with God for mercy. But the wrath of God would not be appeased or held back until our Lord Jesus himself appeared to her. And he gave her the words of a prayer that she was to offer to God and to teach others to pray. He instructed her, to say on her rosary beads, on the Our Father bead, these words, Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. And then on the Hail Mary bead, she was to pray for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. And of course, we sing these beautiful prayers before every weekend mass. If you listen carefully to the words of those two prayers that comprise the chaplet of divine mercy, you recognize how Eucharistic they are in nature. In other words, our Lord invites us to unite ourselves, our prayer, our hearts to his perfect sacrifice for our Lord offers himself eternally to God the Father for our sake. Body and blood, soul and divinity. In this way, we please 
God, our Heavenly Father, by our prayer and acknowledge that it is by the passion and death of his eternal Son that we have been saved. In a subsequent entry in the diary, beginning with number 1209, our Lord gives St. Faustina the novena of divine mercy, nine special prayer intentions which are to be offered to God, our Lord says, from Good Friday until Easter Saturday, which was yesterday. These special intentions range all the way from prayer for devout, devout souls and the souls of innocent children to lukewarm souls and those who do not believe in God. And somewhere in that spectrum of intentions, all of us, all of God's people, are included, for no one is beyond the reach of God's mercy as long as there is life in the body and hope in the heart. In fact, our Lord said to St. Faustina, the greater the sinner, the greater his or her right to my mercy, if we but repent and believe. Fifth and finally, the Lord told St. Faustina that she was to have an image of him painted, an image of him as he had appeared to her. The Lord appeared in this manner to St. Faustina over a period of seven years, from 1931 to 1938, which was the time of her death. In Numbers 47 and 48 of her diary, we read, In the evening, I saw the Lord Jesus clothed in a white garment, one hand was raised in a gesture of blessing, while the other touched the garment at his breast. From beneath his garment there emanated two large rays of light, one red, the other pale. And our Lord said, paint an image according to the pattern you see with the signature, Jesus, I trust in you. Our Lord went on to say, I desire that this image be venerated first in your chapel and then throughout the world. And I promise that the soul who will venerate this image will not perish. I also promise victory over its enemies here on earth, especially at the hour of death. For I myself will defend such a soul by my own glory, as my own glory. What a tremendous promise the Lord has made, and I certainly encourage all of you to have the image of divine mercy in your own home. These are the five essential aspects of the message that Jesus gave to St. Faustina. They can easily be remembered by means of an acronym, namely Finch, F-I-N-C-H, just like the little bird, F. The Feast of Divine Mercy, I, the Image of Divine Mercy, N, the Novena of Divine Mercy, C, the Chaplet of Divine Mercy, and H, the Hour of Divine Mercy. Jesus Christ, Son of the Living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus, I trust in you.